Good morning, Ron. It's a pleasure that you could be here with us this morning to uh, share some stories. Uh, 2015 is a year of celebration. I think the uh, fire department is close to 60 years of age. The city is 50 years, and Lions Club is 40, and the chamber 30. So uh, we want to capture some of the stories that you recall. Tell us your name and where you were born. Okay. My name is Ron Molenberg. I was born in Houston, Texas. And what was your role in the community? My present role in the community is I'm the fire chief for Pflugerville Fire Department, also known as Travis County Emergency Service District Number 2. Uh, so when did you come to Pflugerville and what was your first impression of this village? I first came to Pflugerville uh, when I was in the eighth grade. Uh, uh, my brother and I came to live with our foster parents and uh, my first introduction to Pflugerville was, wow, um, this is different. And certainly having, you know, lived uh, in Houston, you can imagine the difference of a small community like Pflugerville compared to what I was accustomed to in Houston and other areas. So uh, it was interesting. And of course, being a teenager, I was filled with uh, more concern about uh, who and how I would fit into this community because everybody was close-knit and most everybody had uh, one of four names in the community and mine certainly didn't match. Um, so what were you doing in 1965, the year that the city was incorporated? Well, in 65, I was still in high school here. Uh, so I don't know that I have much in recollection about uh, what all was involved with the city uh, incorporating as a city, I don't think it really impacted uh, people of my age or even really people across the community except it gave more self-determination and, and uh, placed the dot on the map permanently. What was it like being in high school here in Fliggerfield? Oh, if only we could go back. <laughs> In high school, of course, we were really small. Uh, when I graduated in 1968, there were only 20 kids in our class. So uh, if you uh, did anything in high school, you did it all. So you played football, uh, you ran track, you played basketball, or you were in the band. And uh, so those were the intramural activities, the extracurricular activities, and the whole community seemed to evolve around that. Um, you know, uh, we weren't the uh, historic winning team of the Fluger great Pflugerville era for football. Uh, I'm afraid we may have disappointed a lot of people, but they still showed up on Friday nights. And that was huge. Uh, this town uh, came to life on Friday night when there was football here. The football field was uh, very near uh, Mr. Fritz Fluger's home. Uh, do you have any recollections of Mr. Fritz? Uh, well, I do, because uh, I guess he's uh, my grandfather-in-law. I married uh, his eldest granddaughter. Uh, and I remember Uncle Fritz as uh, being a stern, uh, more stoic, uh, you know, often classified as typical uh, uh, German-type individual. Uh, but he had a heart as big as gold, and he had a work ethic that uh, was unbelievable. He, uh, he worked cattle up until six months before he died and uh, had become too ill to really be out there. So uh, truly a farmer and, in my mind, a hallmark for any community or any family. So his home was uh, directly behind the present Timmerman Elementary School. And uh, his homestead was also a farmstead. He had barns and cattle, et cetera, uh, right in the city. Right. Uh, and that was, as you said, in 65, 67, et cetera, Pflugerville had not begun to really grow at that time. Um, he had, uh, Gillian Creek ran through his property and um, there was uh, an area that was very um, beautiful. Tell us about the, the pasture. The grove, Pfluger Grove was where the family uh, gathered every 4th of July, the Pfluger family, the, the large Pfluger family. Uh, a beautiful place, uh, pecan tree bottom. Uh, I remember several reunions down there. And um, interestingly, yeah, it was uh, uh, a pretty pristine area. Uh, in fact, uh, a buddy of mine and I would sneak down there to uh, go fishing. 
um, and only got caught one time. So uh, I have a lot of memories of Fligger Grove and, and the family reunions, the big barbecues, uh, and even the church, the Emanuel Lutheran Church here uh, would hold its annual picnic down there. So the Grove, or Fligger Park as it's called now, uh, was the gathering place for uh, social activity of the community in that, that era. It was eventually, I think, donated to the city by whom? Well, Leon and Gladys, uh, Fritz's daughter and her husband, Leon, uh, donated that uh, property to become parkland. Uh, over the decades then, uh, being a resident here, um, you've seen drought, you've seen floods. Are any of those uh, memorable events regarding that area of the city? Well, I guess each one has its own uh, characteristic. The, the floods, of course, because, uh, you know, it, uh, a lot of devastation along the creek, but uh, we're more prone not to have built in those years close to water because I think maybe we were wiser and didn't, didn't crowd the, the natural tributaries as much as we do today. So I've watched that flooding situation change from the, the attitude, yeah, it's a lot of rain, it is flooding, there's going to be damage, but uh, to where we are now where we have torrential rains in my present role, I get concerned about people who want to drive in uh, low water crossings to those who have uh, homes uh, close to low water. Uh, the drought is always a concern, uh, you know, from the days when this was a farming community because of what it meant to uh, farmers trying to make a living off the land uh, today because there's not near the farming land anymore, but we have a lot of grasslands around here. Uh, up until, you know, and, and we see it as it evolves with the incidence of fire. And in 2011, um, we, we saw that here. Uh, everybody will remember the Bastrop fire and the huge devastation there. Well, actually, uh, that fire siege started here that morning about 9 o'clock. Uh, and we were fortunate because we were early to get the resources that we needed and we were able to control the numerous fires that were in our community that day and through that week. Uh, one of the critical um, elements, I think, in that fire was the uh, proximity of Lake Pflugerville. Was it used in helping to fight the fire? Oh, most definitely. Uh, the, that particular, we call it the Labor Day Fire Complex. Uh, that fire began uh, up off of Hottie Lane uh, and began to move south and to the, uh, to the east. And had it not been for the fact, and again, we were early in the fire siege for the area in general, I had three helicopters flying that fire, dropping water. Uh, it would have been a lot worse had we not had them. As it was, we only lost one structure that day. And the wind was blowing from the north at approximately, what, 40, 50 miles an hour? Yeah, it was gusting up to upwards to 40, but we had steady wind all the whole time, and, and when it would change direction on us, it would cause us some problems. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it got so rough that later in the day, we had a fire break out in the edge behind um, uh, the Gatlinburg subdivision and the wind uh, had popped a power line, set one house on fire and we ended up with three because of the wind swirls between uh, the area down there. So uh, the, the fire experts in the state and the nation now look upon this as being the perfect storm of fires and predict that those conditions can occur again. Um and talking about major events, that was one. Uh, if we go back a couple of decades in the mid-70s, and you can give the specific year, there was uh, another memorable fire on Main Street in Pflugerville. Would you describe that from your perspective? Well, from my perspective, uh, I was not in the fire department at that time. I was recently married and was actually uh, working on uh, a car when uh, my brother and I spotted smoke and so we drifted to town where we uh, saw uh, this huge fire and of course in those days everybody pitched in in one way or the other and I got to drag hose and go inside of a burning building and uh, 
you know, literally a, a t-shirt and tennis shoes. Um, and that was an experience that was horrific in my mind. I had never seen so much fire so close. Uh, never realized uh, how dangerous that particular uh, activity was and swore that I would never do it again. Uh, and that was in July of 1971. So how, <clears throat> let's go back to high school now uh, because you graduated uh, and then you had to determine your career. Uh, that was also actually nearly in the Vietnam era. Yeah, those were difficult times for us all. Uh, the 60s, uh, uh, there was a great deal of unrest uh, in the young people. Uh, I think nationwide there was unrest because of the Vietnam War. Uh, I had intentions, I wanted to be a veterinarian. Uh, I was interested in medicine and had a job as a, uh, an assistant to a veterinarian. So that was my focus. And actually, upon graduation, I enrolled in uh, pre-vet medicine uh, at Tarleton State. Uh, and then along came uh, the first lottery in this country. And that first lottery was a drawing for the draft. Uh, I won. I got one of the low numbers. So I was uh, predetermined that I was going to be in the military. So I joined up under a specialty program in the National Guard where I spent two years in active duty, uh, but that whole time I was in uh, medical training and medical service. Uh, so uh, after basic training, I was at Fort Sam at uh, Brook Army Medical and then from there uh, to Fitzsimmons uh, Medical Center in, in uh, Denver, Colorado is how I spent my two years in active military. And of course, there were uh, four to six years beyond that that I was in the Guard and Reserves. Uh, but I was there when the, when the um, uh, POWs brought home. They brought a lot of them into Fitzsimmons because of the uh, nature of our hospital and the care that we were able to provide. Um, an interesting period of time uh, uh, as, a, as a soldier, uh, as a serviceman, uh, we weren't really real welcome around uh, town in Denver. And of course we were the ones with the short hair and the white sidewalls around our ears. And uh, we, I guess we, you know, ran together so we were easily picked out. So we, uh, we felt ostracized as servicemen, uh, at, you know, where we lived. Due to the division on the purpose of the war? Right, okay. right. So uh, then post-war, uh, tell us uh, what you determined to do. Well, I was determined to pick back up where I left off, uh, to get involved in some form of uh, uh, medicine, health care, public, uh, uh, public health. I actually uh, went to uh, uh, Texas A&M University. Uh, I completed a degree in uh, biomedical science, and I went to work uh, for the state health department. And I spent 12 years uh, in public health as an administrator uh, for uh, technical programs and communicable disease. Uh, my prime focus, uh, for a while I was called Mr. Measles. Um, I uh, was uh, primarily associated with vaccine preventable diseases for kids, so I was liaison to the Texas Education Agency for the laws that require kids to be vaccinated when they go to school. Uh, and my focus, again, was on measles. Uh, and other rash fever illnesses, but we had a network that, uh, well, quite literally went worldwide. We were tracking the disease, and uh, we, we felt we could eradicate it like smallpox, but obviously with what's going on right now in the, in the country, uh, that was not a success. Uh, I recall when I was in school, the, uh, again, that department uh, was very diligent that we received polio vaccine because uh, there had been a polio break, uh, mm -hmm. outbreak in the 50s and uh, were there any particular diseases that there was an outbreak during your length of time? Well, I became known as Mr. Measles because that was my focus. Uh, the epidemiology of that disease, so I worked several outbreaks, uh, major outbreaks. I spent a lot of time along the Rio Grande River uh, because the influence or the influx of the disease across the river uh, and getting into a population uh, that 
the focus wasn't so much on getting your kids vaccinated as it was living. So I, I worked uh, a large number of measles outbreaks. Uh, probably the most notable one uh, was at Baylor University. Uh, we uh, had a big outbreak there and it actually got into the football team uh, and we were about to call a halt to the football season for the Southwest Conference and that was not a popular decision. Uh, but at any rate, uh, so I worked uh, pretty, pretty deeply with measles. Whooping cough was another uh, disease that uh, we didn't see in the great outbreak fashion that we did. So I had uh, a, a pretty big hand in uh, working in, across the state with uh, the epidemiology of vaccine preventable diseases. During that time, were you living in Pflugerville? I was. Uh, well, actually, I was. Uh, when I got out of school and got my job, I started off uh, with the state health department and was headquartered in Abilene. And uh, at that time, Gerald Ford was the president, and swine flu was about to hit this country. And that's what got me transferred here because as we ran our swine flu program. Um, there was a, uh, we called them chits. We handed a little piece of paper to everybody who got vaccinated that instructed them that if they felt that they were harmed by the vaccine in any way, they could sue the government and gave them the information. So I was brought into Austin to chase paperwork for the Department of Justice. And that's how we got back to Pflugerville in 1977. Uh, and so you were married at the time. And uh, I'm gonna go back for a moment uh, to capture a German tradition that you and your future wife were the king and queen in I might fight. Describe that, uh, that, that event. Well, that was another one of those great social events that I think everybody went to. I didn't know anybody who didn't. Uh, and um, I was particularly nervous because I didn't know how to waltz or do a polka. And that's a part of the, the thing, you know, you had to participate in the dance. So I somehow bumbled through that. Uh, but it was a lot of fun, uh, an afternoon and an evening, uh, a little hot, I remember, uh, Richland Hall in those days, not a lot of places were air conditioned anyway, but it was hot. So this was uh, an annual event um, for the community. Uh, okay, so uh, you were with the health department and then you uh, decided on a career change, but while you were living in Pflugerville, had you been involved with the... Uh, volunteer fire department? Well, uh, you know, there weren't a lot of activities to begin to be engaged in uh, in Pflugerville. When we came back in 1977, of course, hooked up with some of the guys that I graduated from high school with, and they were volunteer firemen. And so they talked me to coming down to the fire hall on a Thursday night, and it took. And so I joined the volunteer fire department uh, very shortly after moving back to Pflugerville in 1977. Um, got interested in it because it was a great way, again, to socialize. We, we mixed work with socializing. Uh, in those days, the volunteers did everything from uh, repairing, making, building trucks, uh, the, the care and upkeep and maintenance, raising funds to keep the fire department running. And even at that time, we were involved in the Little League uh, for Flugerville. The fire department, uh, the fields for playing Little League Baseball at that time was at the, the fire department where Flugger Hall and the, uh, the conference center now stand. So it, it was a great way to be involved in the community and do good stuff and it could consume an awful lot of time. So that's how I got back to Flugerville and became involved with the fire department. Tell us about some of the fundraisers uh, and uh, then what the proceeds were eventually used for. Well, the fundraisers were the lifeblood. Uh, there was two main fundraisers that the department did. One was uh, called, uh, uh, well, it was a green card. We solicited everybody to donate the grand sum of $10 a year to the fire department in return. Uh, you got an associate member card, a little green card that said for you're an associate member for 10 years, thank you for your donation. And uh, that was mailed to everybody in the school district, which is what the fire department covered. Uh, and then the second big fundraiser was the annual barbecue uh, 
usually in September. And uh, that was another, uh, you know, uh, the, the memories of that. Uh, we'd get cotton trailers and take the side rails off and uh, sell barbecue out of the fire hall and people would come for miles around to have barbecue and uh, listen to Helmer Dahl uh, play uh, the organ. And so uh, it was a great, great time. Uh, another great community social event. And then what were the proceeds uh, used for? Well, the proceeds were actually used to put fuel in the trucks, make the repairs, uh, do whatever the fire department needed to do. And it even went to uh, keeping the field up uh, for the baseball, uh, for the Little League baseball guys. So uh, uh, that money was viewed as the volunteer fire department money and they were the benefactors to a lot of different activities besides keeping it running. Near the baseball field, there was an old building. It was the Schutzenverein that had been a, a, a very glamorous hall once upon a time. Do you recall that building? It was in disrepair. No, that was way before my time. That, yeah. uh, uh, that, that building, I guess, stood until the mid-50s. Uh, and actually, some of the lumber in that went to build the first fire hall, uh, the roofing uh, members in that. But... Uh, uh, I've got, uh, you know, a picture uh, of the old building, but that was gone by the time I came. I think in the present parking lot there is a cedar tree that probably stood very near that building. It's, it's there were two of them, and unfortunately the last one has just recently died. Okay. Uh, they lined the, there was a cedar tree lined uh, road or alleyway that went up to the, to the club. In front of the present building, there is the uh, first fire truck that was uh, purchased. Do you recall the story on that uh, truck? Yeah. Um, interestingly, I think the thought of having a formal chartered fire department was the result of one of those droughts uh, in the 50s, uh, the great drought of the 1950s in Texas. Uh, and some of the prominent community members uh, went around and solicited donations from people in the community. They collected $4,000 and were able to buy that first fire truck. Came from Ackland Chevrolet in Maynard and Sims Fire Truck Manufacturers of San Antonio put the fire body on the back end of it. Uh, and even when I came along, I got to drive and fight fire with that truck. So. Tell us about, uh, so did it have a water tank on it? Uh, and, and where did you get the water? Well, it had a small water tank on it, uh, 250 gallons, which is uh, very small by today's standards. Uh, we would actually pull water from the water system here in Pflugerville. There were a couple of standpipe hydrants that we could pull water from. And I remember, uh, you know, have a fire out in the country, you'd have to drive all the way back to Pflugerville to get water and then drive back out. Tell me about the streets what they were like, uh, 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 either where you lived or along where the railroad south by the fire? Well, uh, most of the streets were in very ill repair. And uh, the gravel, uh, some, some hard top, uh, but they were really rough. And I think that's probably, as Pflugerville became a city, uh, that was one of the early things was to uh, curb and gutter the city streets and, and pave them. I believe uh, Clarence Bowles was the mayor at that time and I remember uh, attending town hall meetings to discuss that major project because certainly uh, wasn't cheap then and wouldn't be cheap now, uh, but it was an effort to improve uh, the look of the city. Uh, also, people traveling on it uh, meant a lot to them. Uh, you were motivated to run for city council in what year and why did you determine to run? Uh, <laughs> I was motivated uh, because I felt like I wanted to give more back, uh, uh, either by genetic flaw or just the way I am. Uh, I'm a public servant at heart and uh, I felt like I could uh, make a difference and help the city grow. And so I ran and got elected. Uh, it was an interesting uh, turn of events because uh, 
when you get calls late at night about garbage collection, uh, you begin to realize how complicated life can be uh, as a council person. Uh, I did, uh, I, I guess I was two, tour, uh, two terms, uh, one or two terms, uh, and it was an interesting time. Uh, it was a period of time where uh, the city budget and everything was handled in one desk drawer. There were two ladies uh, that uh, worked in City Hall. Uh, uh, Clarence Bowles was the uh, city administrator uh, and only one other employee besides him and the two ladies. Uh, Tony Graff did the public utilities. Really a small operation but uh, uh, close to the heart of the city. Uh, and it was hard to uh, manage the meager funds against a city that was just beginning to grow. So what, uh, was, that was probably the main challenge is not having the resources because you were just birthed as a city starting with zero dollars in a budget right. and you had to uh, mainly pro property taxes or permits that you were able to get revenue. Right. Any other uh, issues that you remember from council meetings on the agenda that uh, came well, in that period of time? Was Pflugerville beginning to grow? Pflugerville was beginning to grow, but it wasn't so that uh, uh, it was a huge growth like we see today and we've seen in the past. Uh, I think people were still more focused towards the West Interstate and the beauty of the, the hills and the hill country uh, didn't really think much about coming this direction. Uh, so at that time it wasn't a major uh, happening, uh, so to speak. Um, so then you were with the Volunteer Fire Department uh, and in, was it around 1985-86 that Pflugger Hall was built? Pflugger Hall was built in uh, 80, 86. In 86. So tell us a little bit, uh, I think you were very involved in that process, how it was a dream and to when it became a reality. Well, it was a dream of the Pfluger family to leave a mark of the family on the community and to have a community gathering place. Started out with the thought of having a museum that morphed into more of a just open community hall. Uh, the idea of a museum at that time, people were still pretty close to what we would call artifacts or heirlooms and didn't want them to, uh, we couldn't get any, it's the bottom line. Uh, and yeah, it was uh, as a, a chairman of the fundraiser with the family, uh, we looked about who could be a docent or t caretaker and the vision was directed back to the volunteer fire department because it had been here, uh, was on that property. Uh, so it was in a partnership with the Pfluger family and the fire department that that hall became a reality. And many of the firemen participated in actual construction. Uh, and the, and uh, it was just a, an all out community effort. Um, the land that whole, I don't know how many blocks there, but it has, that presently we have the ESD at the front and the Flicker Hall, and that was originally a part of the George Flicker uh, property, and then um, was it donated to the uh, 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 Schutzenverein, or, or was it? Did, did somebody have to buy that? Or? Well, Schutzenverein sold it to the Volunteer Fire Department for the great sum of ten dollars, and because most of those people who were still, I guess, members or affiliated, it, it was not functional as a as a community club any longer, and those were the same people that were driving the effort to establish a formal fire department. And this was in what was downtown at the time and um, very vital to the community as far as a place to go. Yeah, it was. Uh, like I said, the annual barbecue and I have, going back in time from junior high and high school, a lot of sock hops happened in that old fire hall. Uh, a lot of meetings, community meetings, happened in that fire hall. 
Okay, so we're going to transition now from the volunteer fire department to what became known as the ESD, and uh, I'll let you talk about that birth and your career change and what motivated you on that. Well, I guess, uh, you know, the natural evolution of things, uh, it became uh, hard for volunteers to make the calls. Uh, this community, you know, the farming community, the people who were here uh, would be out in the fields working and those who weren't were in Austin working. So uh, there was not much in the way of manning resources during the day. Uh, and then as the, the later 80s when growth became this direction, uh, the siren would blow and few people would show up. Uh, you know, the truth of the matter is uh, J.B. Marshall Sr., who had a fire phone in his tavern across the street, there were many times when he took the truck by himself to a fire. Um, so there was this increasing demand for service, diminishing personnel to, to do it, and community support from new people coming in expecting this as a service that was provided, financial support was waning. So in the mid 80s, the firefighters as a group said, there's this provision dating uh, to 1940s legislation where a rural fire district could be formed and that would provide property taxes to support the fire department. At that time, it was three cents per 100 valuation. So we went to the community, the idea took, and we became a rural fire prevention district. And then in, 1990, in the late 80s, uh, there had been attempts since the 1940s to change that three cent cap and move it up, but talking taxes at the legislature is like a four-letter word. So they created this new form of district called uh, an emergency service district, and that has a 10 cent cap. And so you see three cents and 10 cents. 10 cents is certainly a lot better than three cents, but what can you buy for a dime today? So that's how districts came to be and how our, our fire department morphed into a district. In 1985, we got our first money as a rural fire district, and we thought it would be like $34,000, and it was $134,000 when all was said and done. And that was huge because uh, we were able to actually get fire gear, bunker gear, protective clothing, for every one of the firemen. And we were actually able to buy nozzles and hose without borrowing from each other to, to put the equipment on the truck. So we saw immediately uh, the fire department actually had nice bunker gear, real helmets and gear that we needed, breathing air packs that were vital to saving a building, literally. And then in the 90s, like I said, we morphed into the emergency services district and have attempted since that time to keep pace. I remember my first year in the fire department in 77, 78, it was like 130 something calls for the whole year. We do more than that in a week now. We're running uh, seven to 8,000 alarms a year. Uh, our role has been not has changed dramatically. Uh, emergency medical services is 75% of what we do. So uh, for every 10 times we're out of the house, uh, seven to eight of them are going to answer somebody's medical emergency. And that's significant coupled to the fact when you understand that over half of those medical emergencies that we respond to are life-threatening situations. So we have, we play a big role in people's lives. Um, what is different today than it was in the 70s and 80s, uh, because of our fire response, our satellite stations, uh, and our commitment to uh, do a lot of things, and we have the technology to do it now, uh, we get a call for a fire in the kitchen. Uh, we may go there in a couple of hours, we'll take care of the situation, 
uh, by the end of the day, when people come back home and drive by it, they'll we'll never know that there was a fire in that house. Uh, whereas heretofore, you know, there was clearly a fire in that house because there wasn't much left of it. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we, we're a lot more sophisticated in the way we deal th with things. Our community uh, per capita answer, answers more cardiac uh, calls than any other uh, community in all of Travis County. Uh, we are the busiest fire department outside the city of Austin. Uh, so we have a lot of demand for our service today. And it's a, it's a true challenge to meet that emergency service demand placed on, on the department. I'm gonna go back to when the rural district was formed. You mentioned also that uh, y'all served basically the uh, school district, Wiggle mm -hmm. Independent School District. So uh, we, as the evolution to the ESD, is that still pretty much your boundaries? Uh, that, that was set in stone and, and you had the authority. Right, and it, it's still pretty much that way. Mm -hmm other than what has been annexed off by Austin. Today, our district is 77 square miles. Uh, we go south uh, to Palmer Lane, Howard Lane, east to Jacobson Road, we, uh, west to 1325, and of course, the county line to the north. Uh, so we have dense population, and we still have a lot of uh, rural farmland. Uh, you mentioned how the expectation of new residents uh, was uh, kind of drove the, the department. Uh, talk a little bit about how you determined and where you uh, put satellite stations. Well, <laughs> we're two stations behind already uh, today. Uh, it, it, in, an in crisis management, you'd like to be in front of the crisis, but we seem to be constantly trying to catch up. So the first station went, uh, first satellite station was in Wells Branch. It was a huge population growth west of I-35. Uh, so that drove us there. The other stations have been driven uh, halfway in an attempt to get ahead of the, the population spurt and, and also in response to population already there. Uh, so when we opened station three uh, out on Kelly Lane, the Black Hawk subdivision, uh, was established and growing. Uh, the station out on the parkway, uh, that area was growing. So uh, we're constantly looking at the situation. We do strategic planning every year to evaluate where our calls are, what our response times, and, and people say, well, what is your response time? The old story is we would tell them what our average response time is. And between us and us, that only tells you that half are worse than that and half are better than that. So to say my average response time is 10 minutes, uh, that doesn't account for the time that I have to go to New Sweden Church running code three and it takes 20 minutes to get there. So we look at population density by grid and the number of calls in there and then we manage to extrapolate our response time in fra what we call fractiles. So we try to hit targets 90% of the time. And of course, the people who live further out, uh, you know, it's a matter of risk and benefit and cost. If uh, we have evaluated that the entire district, if we could locate a fire station appropriate to the land area, there would be 13 fire stations out there. Back to the beginning, um, obviously from the volunteer firefighters, to becoming uh, even professional. There was a uh, training and plan, et cetera. So tell us how that happened and, and how you, uh, were you the first fire chief then of the, of the district and that process? I was the first fire chief. I was the first paid firefighter uh, in the community. Uh, in 1986, the fire department realized that we were going to have to put some people in the station to drive the truck when the alarm came in. And the fire department as a group said, well, let's hire the fire chief and make that person responsible for developing that plan for the future. I was not interested 
uh, in the job. Although I was the volunteer chief, I was not interested in the job because it didn't pay nearly what I was earning. But my buddies talked me into it. And so after some very careful, long conversations with my family, I applied for the job and won it. And so the first thing was to take a look at what we could do uh, legally, uh, given the constraints and overview of paid personnel, and what we needed in the way of trained personnel. Uh, volunteers, as a volunteer fire department, we had a training program uh, that was state certified, but it didn't meet the standards of people who get paid for the job because another state agency governs that entirely. And so uh, our people are now uh, all certified under the Commission for Fire Protection and carry not only the certification for firefighting, several different levels and um, certifications, uh, specialty certifications, as well as they're all uh, EMTs. So we have a lot of people, now that it's a paid service, we have a lot of people looking over our shoulder with regulatory power. Uh, and that's changed that complexion a whole lot. But I was hired in 1986. In 1987, I hired two firefighters and we only could work them 40 hours a week because we were still operating as the volunteer fire department paying these people. So the first full-time firefighters were not hired until 1996. We hired three. And those were the first firefighters that we put on the trucks for 24 hours a day, uh, one a day, and then we had volunteers filling and I hired part-time people. We tried every mix under the sun to remain with the volunteer as long as we could because it was a much better, um, economically made more sense and certainly served the community better. Um, and a lot of our volunteers went on to become paid firefighters too. So uh, it was building a career, if you will. And today um, I have, uh, our department has uh, 80, 80 uniform personnel. Those are all certified firefighters in one role or another, and uh, we have, we're authorized 10 civilian staff. And those are the people that provide the support services. As a citizen, uh, this, um, you know, you didn't have GPS no. 35 years ago, 40 years, 60 years ago when the volunteers started. But you would call and you know that if uh, Ron answered the fire phone and Vernon Chain said her house was on fire, Ron knew exactly you know where to go. go. And today's world is quite different. Um, and the training to know how to, to get someplace quickly is. Yeah, it is a world difference. Uh, the first maps that we had of the area out here were hand drawn in that fire station down there. Uh, I participated a lot in that project. Uh, today, uh, we have computer aided dispatch. Uh, our fire trucks are seen on uh, the, mother, the mother computer. So if that fire truck's moving down the road, is being tracked on on a computer uh, and we actually are able by GPS and those computers on board to direct uh, resources to to the problem wouldn't be able to do it any other way today with this you know much growth is going on and uh, streets is, I, it's, I couldn't begin to tell you how many different street names we have uh, you know in our directory today um, the department has uh, been known for its training, not only of our local uh, servants, but even beyond. Uh, so share how people see this as a model uh, operation and come and learn. Well, uh, I think the, the, our first step into that arena uh, was uh, looking around and because of water supply in the rural area, and, the, uh, you know, I told you before, you have to drive to Pflugerville to get water to go back to Seal or wherever. Um, there was an emerging technology that was being used in the Timberlands that I I've, was interested in and began to look at it. And it's called compressed air foam systems. And uh, 
So we went and looked at these systems and actually introduced calves to our department to, at that time, the Board of Commissioners, and I told them that we would be able to uh, save on fire trucks, uh, save on wear and tear on our personnel, and certainly conserve um, a valuable resource, and that's water. And it has panned out. It is and now a common technology, not only in Texas, but across the country. But it was, we were the first in this state uh, to embrace it in this area and embrace it to the extent that in uh, the late 80s and early 90s, we were successful before the state legislature in getting credit, homeowner insurance credit for depart people who lived in areas where departments use this technology. And today, uh, we are in all calves operation. So we've had departments from all over the state and the country come in and look at how we perform with this. Uh, we've done a lot of training in that regard. And like I said, it's become a more accepted technology in the country. And the fact that our department led the change statewide to insurance credit has brought other states in to see how we affected the, the, that change. So that, with the way that we manage ourselves, and uh, I tell folks I'm not uh, a traditionalist, I'm kind of a radical and like to think about things outside the box, and we encourage our entire department to do that. Uh, we hold uh, the newest guy responsible for himself and the job he's supposed to perform, guys and gals, uh, and everybody knows the job above and below them. And so we're not so regimented in the old traditionalism that this is all I can do. Um, our guys, if you challenge them, will tell you that we require training 365 days a year, and it's a fact. Um, and that is, comes back to the way it was in the old days. If the fire phone rang at 2 a.m. in the morning, have you ever gotten up? at two o'clock in the morning from a dead sleep and had to perform some complex operation. You have to do it on rote memory and uh, what you've been trained to do. And so, uh, and, you know, it, it sounds corny, but uh, our philosophy is nobody dies at work in our business. There are uh, challenges in that um, arena whenever you have a uh, major event and then how you support your employees and their families. And so uh, what kind of uh, recreation or entertainment uh, downtime? Uh, is there anything uh, organized? Not so much anymore because the employees, the each shift is a little different. Uh, if you go and talk to A shift, they say B shifts are the slackers and C shift. Uh, but what we do is encourage them that their families are free to come to the fire station. And if you come by here on the holidays, you'll see a lot of fire trucks in front of Pfluger Hall. Families are having dinner together. Uh, they socialize together. Uh, we, you know, we still get together and try to have parties. And we're, we're looking a lot at that because, as you point out, it's a big year for us, too. This is our 60th anniversary. And we've begun talking about, you know, whether it's like an old time barbecue or some sort of uh, event that we can, you know, stop and take a moment and appreciate our families, our firefighters, from the volunteers to who we have today uh, for growing to this point. Um, the fire department has been an integral part of the community and always visible. And one of those um, places is in the Deutschen Fest Parade and then to talk a little bit about the parade, but also what you, um, over the decades, how has your responsibility uh, evolved uh, for that one-time event when you have the population, quote, of the city? Uh, well, we've had changing roles, obviously. Uh, I think early on, well, uh, Deutschen Fest was a fun time for me. I served as the entertainment chairman for a number of years uh, for the Deutschen Fest Committee. Um, in the early years, the fire department uh, uh, realized an opportunity to get a little more money in, in the coffers and actually charged for parking in 
at that time, Leon Pfluger's pasture. Uh, they managed the gates uh, for the city, uh, helped with this, uh, you know, crowd and, and traffic control. Uh, police department n needed help, so you know we direct traffic with them. Uh, we did first aid, of course, in in the park, and a lot of times ran the command center. Uh, there are more people involved in it now, so we kind of have backed out of that arena. Uh, we still provide an EMS, emergency medical service presence in there. Uh, the uh, fun run, the, 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 the race, uh, generally starts somewhere around uh, the fire department properties. Uh, because of the number of people in town and the, uh, the difficulty in moving, we always have an incident, uh, emergency incident plan in place uh, for, for helicopter and me medical service and how we get around. Uh, we always have extra people on staff. Uh, we're not able to put as many people uh, physically in the park anymore because uh, you know, there's other emergencies that go on and that's kind of what's happened as the community's grown while that, the Deutschenfest was going on in those early years of Deutschenfest, that'd be the only th place anything was happening because everybody was there. Now there's just as many people or more outside of the, that particular arena, so we have to be ready to protect and, to, and do what we have to do for those folks too. So uh, we've had kind of a, you know, in and out role, uh, more visible, less visible, more visible. Uh, it's, you know, Again, if you think you got the answers, just wait and see. They'll change tomorrow. Um, well, one of the things I, um, I I see in your what you told me, you started off with biomedical mm -hmm. and did that for a while. Then you got into strictly firefighting, but then here we go, and you uh, expanded. Uh, so do you have to do the training for the EMS folks too, or you you oversee them? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, and, and that whole thing is still a very vital part of any citizen that we have a, uh, a safe community and that we have responders that can deal with emergencies. Right, uh, and, and it doesn't end there. Uh, because of the changing environment, affordable health care being one of those uh, influencing factors, uh, right now our strategic plan is pushing us to providing higher level emergency medical care prior to the ambulance getting there. And even to the point that someday this department may actually be involved in transport. Today the ambulances are here uh, by contract with Travis County and the city of Austin. Unfortunately, unfortunately, and it, and it bothers me a great deal, 40% of the time there is no advanced level of care available in this community because those two ambulances are committed elsewhere. And that is a dangerous statistic. And uh, before I hang up my badge, I want to see that statistic changed. Uh, talking about uh, response time and communication, if we go back on the 60 years, um, there was, you'd have to pick up the phone and call somebody and wait for somebody. Uh, I know there's a command center in Austin now. Mm. Talk about the uh, level of interaction between, uh, among the different entities and how you work together. Well, uh, again, on the face of a, a bad drought in the late 80s and 90s, uh, Travis County was facing a bad time. Uh, we, our department, was key to moving toward what we call CRC, County Resource Coordination, where we laid down our political boundaries and said we would send resources from one end of the county to the other uh, on a moment's notice in response to these grass fires. That grew from brush and grass fires to an all-hazard uh, response, and today it's an automatic aid response. With technology in those days, we'd call on the phone or call on the radio and say, I need a task force for a brush fire or I need a strike team for flood rescue. And we'd muster that together generally by radio or telephone. 
Today, all those resources are available at the touch of a button in the Combined Communication Center, which is at the old Austin Airport. Uh, and it's the uh, CTEC, the Combined Transportation Emergency Coordination Center. And as I said earlier, uh, all those resources are managed by the computer. And so what you'll see today, we have an automatic aid agreement with the city of Austin and six other districts around us. So they know if all my equipment is committed on one thing, they will pull the closest resources in. And many times you'll see an Austin fire truck sitting here in downtown Pflugerville. And vice versa, we go that way. Do y'all keep tabs, uh, you know, since 9-11, the Homeland Security uh, Department was formed. Are y'all tuned in to them in any manner? Yeah, we're considered the uh, first response for everything. Uh, and we still, uh, we receive intelligence about threat levels. Uh, and obviously, you don't see our doors on our fire stations wide open as much anymore. Uh, because they, there have been instances where equipment was stolen to use in an event. Uh, yes. Uh, Terrorism, whether it's homebrewed or from foreign influence, has to be a concern of ours. Uh, we still respond. Uh, you, you remember the early events of a few years ago, the anthrax through the mail? We still respond to calls of that nature today. Which goes to um, recollections of your more interesting cases that were you, you, th you said you like to think out of the box, and you have uh, the regular expected calls. Were there any of those unexpected things that are kind of etched in your mind that were kind of crazy without mentioning specific hmm. names? Well, I, won't, I certainly won't mention names, but sometimes uh, uh, you find people will try to generate emergency just to have some company. Uh, I understand that. And... Uh, uh, I don't get angry with that sort of thing. Uh, you know, again, we're here, you, your emergency is your emergency. It may not necessarily be mine, but I'm making it mine when you call me. Uh, as this city and the area has grown and changed, uh, obviously we've gone from rooftops to uh, more uh, industrial, uh, commercial, and even we have, uh, you know, a destination water park. So uh, you guys have to stay on top of buildings and how you would, uh, how would you uh, approach that? And actually you go through and have to give a, a permit or code, don't you, something? In right, we, we're involved uh, hand in hand with the city from the point of development to building and to actual, actual occupancy. Uh, we're contracted to the city to do plan reviews and do inspections on those. So. Uh, we want the environment safe, the building safe, from the day it's thought of to the day that it's opened up because there's real people in those buildings and there's real citizens going in and out of those buildings. Uh, heretofore, uh, before there was a code out here, uh, there's a lot of seriously wrong buildings and some very near misses to being fatalities involved because of construction or, or practices. So uh, we're involved in, in the growth of the community. We embrace the growth of the community because certainly, you know, we're a governmental entity and survived by the taxes of the area. So uh, we want to see the growth, but we want to see it done, uh, you know, in a safe manner so that we're not regretting uh, having looked the other way. So the oversight begins at the concept, follows through the construction, and then uh, periodically, uh, in some cases, there you have to go back for inspections on a, oh, yes. a, a certain basis. Our goal is once a year that we're inspecting all commercial establishments. Uh, we're not able to keep pace with that at this point uh, because our focus is the, the new growth and making sure it comes off the ground right. Um, Talk about volunteerism. Uh, I know that uh, uh, we talked about the volunteer firemen, but uh, 
you have other areas that you have volunteered in in addition to your work. Can you talk about any of those? Well, <laughs> a lot. I, I, I told you I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for helping people. I've uh, been involved with the Boy Scouts of America, worked with the church and the church youth. Uh, I, uh, in, in uh, the, the profession in, in, in public safety and fire, I've uh, been involved in a number of uh, state, local and state. Uh, I was, on the, you mentioned a while ago, 9-11. Uh, at that time, I was a, a, a member of the uh, management group for uh, weapons of mass destruction. Spent three days in the uh, emergency planning center, locked up behind a big steel door. So I've, you know, I'm, I'm quite likely to be involved in a lot of different things that, you know, I do it and don't even stop to think about it anymore. Uh, I, I guess one, one really interesting thing that I got, I'm, uh, I met a, a gentleman from England some years ago, and as we talked, we realized we had a lot in common and had developed a friendship. And he was involved with the volunteer aspect of uh, uh, Great Britain's volunteer fire service going back to the days of World War II. And we coined the idea, you know, in, in our business, the white shirts get to do a lot of stuff, chief officers, exchange programs are pretty common, uh, but there was nothing for the firefighters. So we schemed a, a plan and were actually able to exchange Pflugerville firefighters with firefighters from Great Britain for a period of, we'd send our guys over there for a couple of weeks and we'd take some of their guys for a couple of weeks, put them on the trucks and show them the differences between the two countries. So the firefighters on the street got to understand what was going on. Uh, and for that effort, uh, I was awarded uh, uh, an honorary membership in the British Fire Services Association, only the second American to ever receive that. So, uh, you know, again, and I didn't do it for the honor or the accolade. It, it was a neat thing to do and it was the right thing to do. So what I've done, uh, I don't have any regrets. You have to constantly be on the edge, uh, meaning that you have to stay informed and keep up with um, the evolution locally and statewide and nationally because of the nature of your business. Right. How do you how do you keep up with everything? Well, uh, it's harder and harder because the technology is changing so rapidly right now. Uh, but I participate in a number of uh, leadership conferences through the year. I'm a member of the International Fire Chiefs Association. So uh, each year I go to this week-long conference that uh, chief officers from literally around the world and uh, try to stay attuned to what's going on and the, the, the problems that we're faced with in our business. Um. I want to go back now to a totally different topic. Uh, when you were in school, high school, what was the recreation and entertainment in this community? Mischief, with a capital in them. <laughs> uh, different kind of mischief. Uh, you know, I don't know that there was as much free time then as there were now because uh, I know for the boys anyway, I, you know, hauled hay in the summer. Uh, I always had a part-time job. Uh, and when there, you know, when it got to be close to school time and football practice, you know, we had football practice in the evening. So you'd literally come out of the hay field and out on the football field. So mischief in the way of, you know, good practical jokes. Uh, uh, Perhaps I shouldn't say it, but one of the, the, the fun things that we did, we'd come in for football practice, and then afterwards we'd go to Tufts Tavern and sit on the, on the steps out there and, and drink uh, soda water pop and tell stories and pull practical jokes, uh, you know, or, or threaten, you know, to lay down in the street till the next car came through and you could fall asleep, literally. So, uh, you know, I, I didn't play 
uh, intramural football, little league, and that. It just those opportunities weren't there. We went fishing, uh, you know. We chummed around hunting with our friends, uh, so it was more, <laughs> I guess, storybook kinds of of entertainment. So where could you go to get a burger? Well, uh, fortunately, uh, my wife's uh, father decided that he wanted to, to build something that people could go to at night, and so he built the Hillside Hut. Uh, and uh, just to the um, east of the Rock Gym, uh, an A-frame building that uh, he served burgers and fries and then eventually steaks. And uh, that was a popular gra <laughs> uh, place to gravitate to to have our conversation. So, you know, instead of sitting in, uh, you know, out on the porch at uh, Tufts Tavern, we were down there sitting on the picnic benches at the hut. So uh, that became the second uh, he was the chief cook. He was the chief cook and bottle washer. And uh, since I was dating his daughter, I got to sit a lot of times and visit with him. Uh, we became fast friends uh, through the years as I uh, sat down there. Um, he was also uh, involved with Mr. George Pluger in the meat market yeah. and making barbecue. I don't know if that was before or after the hut, but... Uh, he was a barbecuer. Yeah, sure. that was actually before the hut. Once he got into the hut, that was a, a, a full lifetime. Uh, yeah, uh, George, uh, his cousin George, and and he uh, barbecued every weekend uh, at the meat market. And uh, you know, it was interesting when IBM came to the Austin area. Uh, you could go in there on Fridays, and half the IBM plant, it seemed like, were sitting in there eating barbecue. Uh, so uh, that was another uh, another good place to socialize. Predominantly male, though, back in those days. Describe that building in a sense. <laughs> uh, from the standpoint of my profession today, or <laughs> what the building, the the you know we nearly lost that building in 1971. Uh, it's typical construction of the era in which it was built. Wood construction. Uh, the electrical service in it was poor. Uh, you know, it, it, it met the standard of the day, whatever that standard was or whoever applied it. Drafty in the wintertime, you know, a wood stove heated it, but you had to sit real close to the wood stove. Uh, and they had a barbecue pit inside, and it adjoined Tufts Tavern. So you went back and forth. You go buy your beer at Tuff and come back to the table and eat your barbecue. Uh, a lot of people had nicknames back then, uh, and uh, I remember, I think, Leon was called Shotgun. Yeah, uh, you know, and I tried uh, for the life of me to determine that. The nearest thing I could figure, and it was uh, putting stories together, I think he discharged a shotgun in the meat market at one inappropriate time. When he was a young man. Yes. <laughs> and then uh, Mr. Burwell Knable, who was uh, on the... Uh, city council for nearly uh, a decade um, uh, at the beginning of the city. Uh, his nickname was Tough, yeah. and I don't know uh, his name. I've heard he was in a marble game, and he was tough to beat, but I don't know. You know, tough was always tough to me. I, I, I did, you know, somebody would say Burwell, and you'd have, who's that? Mm -hmm. uh, another early leader was Mr. I.B. Uh He was actually the mayor for the first 10 or 12 years. Uh, tell us about him. Well, in my mind, I.B. was probably one of the most gentle, kind individuals I, I've ever known uh, as a young person and even today. I, I have very fond memories of I.B. and his wife, Pearl. Uh, when my little brother and I came to this community to live, I think I.B. was uh, one of the first to greet me uh, and welcome me to Pflugerville. Um, and another one of those uh, uh, community-spirited individuals. We go back to something that was uh, a period of time there that I'd like to talk about it is uh, the names of people, and you refer to IB. People used their initials. There was JB, mm -hmm. uh, there was AT or whomever you might be talking about, uh, and they just used their birth name initials. Uh, it was just a custom. I don't know any more detail as to why. 
I don't either, but that's, uh, you know, J.B. Uh, uh, Junior and J.B. Senior, J.B. Marshall. Uh, never knew any other name except J.B. Now, J.B. Junior became the uh, judge for many years for the right. city. Do you have any recollections of uh, what his role was other than, I guess, with tickets? No, but if anybody needed a legal uh, advice, they went to J.B. In fact, J.B., helped the fire department file the first papers to become a rural uh, fire prevention district because J.B. was the lawyer. In town, okay. All right. Um, is there anything else that you have as about the, the, the village to the town era that you would like to share? You know, I think you probably drug more out of me this morning than I'm accustomed to, to talking about. I, it, you know... Lots of fond memories, lots of fond memories. Um, and so what do you see as your, um, in your strategic plan or your personal vision? You've already mentioned that you need more ambulances or, or uh, emergency vehicles. Anything else that you uh, would like to leave as a dream? Well, I think it's harder and harder to define Pflugerville. Uh, you know, what is Pflugerville? Uh, we lived in Idlehour Acres, west of I-35. We were Pflugerville then. Uh, you talk to somebody over there about Pflugerville, the very best you can get, no, we live in Wells Branch. Uh, I think Pflugerville is, is, is almost like that adolescent child at this point, uh, developing its new personality rather than it was a farm community. What is it yet to become? And I, you know, I, w I wouldn't begin to speculate. If you ask me what my plans are for the next five years, I can probably tell you a lot of stuff. If you ask me what the city's going to look like in 10 to 20 years, all I can say is look back 20 years and compare what you have and then try to speculate from that. And it's, uh, it's mind boggling. When SH 130 came in, did that impact your fire department in any way? <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, we said early on that uh, it wouldn't bring much in the way of call volume, numbers of calls, and it hasn't. But I can promise you every call that we attend out there, every vehicle accident is, is bad uh, because it's a high-speed accident. And uh, with the momentum and much of that roadway is elevated or uh, overpass. Uh, the, some pretty complex events happen along SH 130. Uh, the other complexity is is because of the one-way traffic. Uh, you don't just get out there and hop the median and take care of the problem. It's a long way up to make a crossover and come back. So uh, uh, 130, while it's traffic through our community, it's almost like a fence, and you got to get to the right place to cross it. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I would thank you for your service to our country, your service to our community and to our state, and uh, for your passion for the community where you grew up and uh, making it be the best that it could be and for protecting us on all fronts. Well, thank you.